the English Channel swim from England to France is approximately 21 miles or 32 kilometres. Due to the currents, winds and other factors, swimmers should anticipate to train to swim significantly more miles. For long distance swimming, regardless of the distance swum on the day, a straight line distance of about 21 miles or 34 kilometres is the achievement that gets recorded. Like any extreme sport, channel swimming has risks attached to it and over the years 10 swimmers have died while attempting the swim. When starting to train for a big swim such as this, the most important piece of technology to invest in is a GPS distance and speed tracking watch. This is the only way to ensure that you meet your daily, weekly and monthly training goals. Not only is the overall distance trained important, but swimming at a consistent pace is one of the most essential requirements to increase your chances of success. It's very easy to not notice how your speed goes down as you get tired of training every day. And having a speed tracking watch is one of the ways to help keep you aware of this. For example, if you swim at a pace of 3 km per hour, you'll want to do a 30 km swim and that'll take 10 hours. If in the training, after two or three hours, you reduce your speed to two and a half kilometers per hour, you could be adding many extra hours to your swim, and this may be the thing that dooms you to failure before you even start, especially if you're swimming in an area that requires a minimum speed to outswim the current or to reach a required position by a certain time before the tide changes and pushes against you, making it impossible to continue. When attempting a giant swim such as the English Channel, there's certain factors that are out of your control. The tide, the wind, waves and the currents can all put an end to your swim. Temperature and even jellyfish can also cause problems. Some of the most important things to do are to make sure that you find an experienced captain who's got experience navigating the water and who knows the change of tide. And then, as there's usually a high demand and a long waiting list, hope that you get a good day where the tide and weather conditions suit. There's many videos that you can watch to help to improve your stroke. The more resistance and drag that you create, the slower you'll go and the more calories that you'll waste. The only tips that can be conveyed in a podcast format is in order to reduce the drag, your legs need to go up and one way to help this is to put your head down in the water. This involves swiveling your hips to rotate your body from side to side to allow you to breathe while lying flat in the water. In other words, turn your body, not your head, to breathe. Turning your head for hours will lead to shoulder and neck pain and even damage. The other tip, in order to reduce resistance, look at your fingertips as they enter the water. If there's lots of air bubbles, you're losing potential energy. You want to practice altering the angle of your fingertips hitting the water in a way that reduces as many air bubbles as possible. This will improve the power and the speed of your stroke. In order to build muscle, you want to ensure that you're consuming enough protein. Typical recommendations are 1 to 1.6 grams of protein per kg of body weight per day. My advice is not to use the whey or any dairy source as we're not designed to consume dairy and many people, even if they're unaware of lactose intolerance symptoms, they're still consuming an inflammatory substance that in time can contribute to an autoimmune condition. Also, most protein drinks contain terrible artificial sweeteners such as aspartame and sucralose, which are linked to numerous damaging effects on the mind and the body. I mention the damaging effect of sweeteners in my Parkinson's video and in my fibromyalgia video for more detail. I'm someone who's pro supplements, however, when it comes to protein, the best source is food like eggs, steak, chicken, etc. Or if you're vegan, pea and rice protein, but definitely not soy protein. If you're not professionally competing, you can check out my video on why people are turning to SARMs to see how that these can increase your nitrogen retention in the muscles, and this allows you to build muscle on a lower amount of protein. You should try to increase insulin sensitivity, which is like reversing the onset of type 2 diabetes. You can see my other video on type 2 diabetes for more information on this. One good example of this is berberine hydrochloride, 
when taken at doses of 500 milligrams three times per day. It helps to not only increase the insulin sensitivity, but it also helps to shuttle the excess blood sugar into the muscles instead of letting it turn into excess belly fat. This causes enhanced muscle growth. The berberine has numerous benefits, indicating that it's a powerful life extension herb. You want plenty of good fat in your diet to help to build the required body fat that you need for the endurance swim and the cold water. Some of the best fats would be olive oil, fish oil, coconut oil, avocado, butter, ghee and even lard. New research is showing how these are what we need and how the previously thought of good refined vegetable fats like rapeseed oil or hydrogenated vegetable oil spreads and shortening are the real poison. Timing is everything with endurance training, so you should learn how to optimise your schedule for the most benefits. For example, if you're training to do a 40 km swim, you need to train by swimming 40 km a week, each week for 12 weeks prior to the swim, in order to accumulate the sufficient muscle. It's possible that some people do less training and still manage to complete their swim, due to many factors such as luck, good weather, etc., but the chances of causing serious career-ending injury massively increase if you try to take shortcuts and don't put in the hours training. A basic guide for a 40 km swim. We'll start at the swim and then work backwards. They say you should do at least one half the distance swim before the event, so that means you'll have to do a 20 km swim at some point. One week you should also do four 10 km swims. You should be doing 5.7 kilometers every day for around three months prior to the big swim. Seven days before the big swim, you should be resting your arms and not swimming at all. This will allow creatine, carnosine and glycogen stores to build in your muscles and it will also give time for any inflammation to have subsided prior to the event. In the week before, many cold showers each day would be recommended to help to keep your body prepared for the cold on the big swim. Back to needing to swim 5.7 kilometers per day for three months. Chances are that if you start swimming that much from scratch, you'll damage your muscles or burn out quickly. The 10% rule states that you should only increase your weekly mileage or volume in increments of 10%. So if you're running 30 miles this week, you should only run three more miles next week. I swim at three kilometers per hour. What I do each year is one and a half kilometers per day in April, three kilometers per day in May, then four kilometers per day in June, July and August. This means I'm ready to do a 28 kilometer swim by September as I've built up slowly and I never have caused any damage in my 10 years of swimming unlike others that I know who've damaged their shoulders, for example. This will show you that you need to start training five to six months before a big event, like a channel swim, to increase your chance of success. The most effective way to gain strength, muscle and prepare for endurance is to take off days. This means you can take advantage of a few principles. So first, if you're swimming 40 kilometers per week, instead of swimming 5.7 kilometers every day. You actually have better muscle gains if you can do three 13 kilometer swims. This means Monday do 13 kilometers, then rest Tuesday and Wednesday. Swim 13 kilometers on Thursday, then rest Friday, and swim 13 kilometers on Saturday, and rest again on Sunday, and repeat this the next week. By doing this, you're not only getting acclimated to being in the cold water for longer, you're also causing small damage to the muscles on those long hard training days. And then by having rest days, this allows the muscles to repair, which is what's required to increase the strength and size. With this, you can also take advantage of not building up a caffeine tolerance and take the caffeine on your training days and none on your off days, allowing you to push yourself harder and letting you keep to a low dose of caffeine that's still effective at improving your training. You'll get much better results 
if you incorporate days off into your training cycle instead of just swimming at the same distance every day for months. This just tells your body that there's no need to expect a bigger challenge and you stop growing any new muscle. Another area overlooked by many swimmers is joint support. See my videos on joint support and on arthritis to learn more about supplying the building blocks that your body requires to help to prevent damage. For swimming, this is usually caused by the many hours of grinding the unlubricated shoulder joints, ignoring the warning signs of pain until it finally gives up and requires either surgery or retirement. This could be easily prevented by hydrating the joints with things like hyaluronic acid, MSM, gelatin and collagen. This is one of the many examples of how prevention is better than cure and if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. When doing the big swim, seasickness can be a big problem. There's a few natural remedies that can help if you don't want to be taking prescription anti-nausea medication. Ginger and CBD. Ginger has long been used as an alternative medication to prevent motion sickness. The mechanism of its action, however, is unknown. It's hypothesized that the ginger ameliorates the nausea that's associated with motion sickness by preventing the development of gastric dysrhythmias and the elevation of plasma vasopressin. CBD is also an effective motion sickness treatment because of its anti-mimetic property and it's actually a safer option than many conventional drugs on the market for motion sickness. You can see my other video on CBD and blood flow in the brain for more information about CBD's benefits. On the day of the big swim, you should be expecting to drink 500 millilitres of water per hour, with up to 300 calories of carbohydrate added. By having a mixed source of carbohydrate, such as maltodextrin starch and sugar, like glucose, you can enhance the absorption without causing stomach discomfort. One of the most overlooked aspects of feeding is the pH. As you need to consume a lot of calories of carbohydrates, and as sugar is acidic, this can lead to acid indigestion and discomfort over time. You should invest in some alkalinizing pH drops and add them to each feed. This not only helps to reduce the unwanted indigestion, but it can also help to increase blood oxygen levels and reduce lactic acid buildup, making your muscles less sore and making you less out of breath. As you're relying on sugar to help to boost you on the day, there's some things that you can do to help to improve the effect. One of the best ways is to ensure that you remain sensitive to sugar and you're not becoming pre-diabetic, having insulin resistance from a high sugar or carbohydrate diet. This is one reason that sugar should be kept for the day of the big swim. Therefore, as you'll have many months of training before the swim, a diet free of sugar, high in protein, high in fat, and low in carbohydrates would be advised. When you look at the adenosine triphosphate or ATP production pathway, you can see how unimportant and unnecessary carbohydrates are when you're training. Basically sugar, fat and protein all get converted into ATP, which is the energy source that the body needs. It's adenosine with three phosphate ions bonded to it. This powerful chemical bond gets broken and the free high energetic phosphate ion is what powers all the functions in the body. The leftover ADP being adenosine with two phosphate ions then gets regenerated to create more ATP to start the process all over again. When you realize that carbohydrates are only used for ATP but fat is used to make your hormones as well as the ATP and protein is used to repair muscles boost your immune system, etc., as well as making ATP, you can see why high carbohydrate would not be a good idea for the training, especially channel training, which involves overexerting yourself for many months. In this state of overexertion, the abundance of the building blocks of muscles, hormones and the immune system are highly important to help to prevent burnout. Once you go over roughly one hour per day of training, Hormones like testosterone start to fall. Cortisol, stress hormone, starts to rise. The immune system gets taxed and you're more likely to get colds and flus. Oxidation starts to occur and this leads to increased inflammation,
premature ageing and it increases your risk of many health conditions. The amino acid L-glutamine is taken by many marathon runners to help to prevent the negative effects on the immune system and to also help protect the lining of the stomach while training. Nascent iodine for thyroid support is one way to help to provide your body with the necessary ingredients that it needs to produce its own hormones to help fight stress. Some strong antioxidants that I'd recommend are astaxanthin at 12 mg per day. This has also been shown to help to prevent sunburn in rats and this may be beneficial when doing a long swim on a sunny day. Also sunburn is linked to lack of antioxidants indicating the power of this supplement. Liposomal vitamin C is also extremely effective while being very gentle on the stomach. Don't try to substitute with cheap acidic ascorbic acid. Caffeine will definitely help to boost energy levels on a big swim. It's also been shown to reduce the sensation of muscle pain, allowing you to push yourself a little bit harder. The maximum amount of caffeine recommended in a day is 300 milligrams for safety reasons. It takes on average 45 minutes from drinking the caffeine before the effects kick in. The more you can spread out your dose of the caffeine, the better. For example, take 50 milligrams of caffeine each hour for six hours to help with a gradual release. Some of the side effects of caffeine are headaches, restlessness, insomnia, high blood pressure and general overstimulation. The amino acid L-theanine from green tea is great to help to reduce all of these side effects while also extending the duration of the benefits and helping to keep you calm and in a relaxed focused state. Standard ratios of the GABA promoting amino acid L-theanine are two parts theanine to one part caffeine. So 100 milligrams of caffeine plus 200 milligrams of theanine would be a standard mix. One of the best ways to help to improve the benefits of caffeine is to abstain from the caffeine for a few weeks prior to the big swim. This will ensure that you are a well rested and not burned out from the caffeine and b that you'll have increased sensitivity to the caffeine which means that you'll have a greater amount of benefits from a smaller dose. You should have undertaken sufficient training that your first couple of hours of swimming should be caffeine free as you're just getting warmed up. You'll also have glycogen stores in the muscles that should be sufficient to propel you for the first few hours with ease before you start feeling any muscle discomfort. In order to help to build up a zone of compensation such as a buffer barrier to allow your body to take high levels of stress, adaptogenic herbs would be recommended during the months of training. Adaptogens are non-toxic plants that are marketed as helping the body resist stressors of all kinds whether physical, chemical or biological. These herbs and roots have been used for centuries in Chinese and Ayurvedic healing traditions. Some adaptogens are cordyceps mushroom, which helps to increase blood oxygen and endurance. Shisandra, the five flavour berry, which helps the liver. Tulsi or holy basil, which helps to neutralise cortisol stress hormone. Some of particular benefit to channel swimming would be Panax ginseng and Rhodiola rosea. The herbs Panax ginseng and Rhodiola rosea have both been shown to increase your resistance to the cold. The cold can be one of the most challenging aspects of a long swim. The only real way to get used to it is to do all your training in water that's roughly the same temperature. Wim Hof who holds many Guinness World Records involving cold and endurance was tested in a lab and it was shown that the mitochondria in his brown fat was far more active than a normal person. The brown fat content is what's known to help to increase your ability to withstand cold temperatures and the mitochondria are the energy producing factories in the cells that produce the ATP that was previously mentioned. There's a number of clinically proven ways to help to increase and improve the mitochondrial function. You can see my other video on mitochondrial boosters for more information and my video on supplements for endurance. Some of the products, however, are D-ribose, coenzyme Q10 in the form of ubiquinol, PQQ 
and creatine monohydrate. For research purposes, one of the few things shown to remove old damaged mitochondria and help to produce new ones is the chemical SR9009, taken sublingually in DMSO at doses of 50 to 100 milligrams per day. However, like any research chemical, there's a blanket ban by the World Anti-Doping Agency on any product that's not been through full clinical trials. It's also the responsibility of the swimmer to be aware of all of the World Anti-Doping Agency's rules, as some prescription asthma inhalers, for example, are allowed, and others with a similar method of action are banned. This is an important discussion that should be addressed, as many of the supplements that can help one to reach the full potential, and more importantly, can help the body heal from the damaging, ageing effects of overtraining, are readily legally available to the public, but they're banned by these sporting bodies. Their outdated idea of everyone competing on an equal playing ground doesn't hold weight when some people, through genetic variability, are born with double the testosterone of others, or they produce more anti-ageing, muscle building, healing growth hormone, for example. Even in swimming, women have more advantage in long distance due to the fat distribution in their body. And the taller you are, the longer your arms, which means the faster that you swim. You can see my other video on life extension using a mix of DHEA, berberine and growth hormone for more information about some ways to extend your life. Bodybuilders who are trying to gain muscle tried to take anti-inflammatories. Although this allowed them to return to the gym each day pain-free, they didn't end up gaining any extra muscle. They then had the idea that the inflammation was necessary to tear the muscles, and this process of repairing the torn microfibers in the muscles is what leads to their growth. Then they tried supplementing with arachidonic acid, a pro-inflammatory substance, and they found the muscle grew. So arachidonic acid is a powerful natural substance that can help to increase muscle size. The saying, no pain, no gain, applies here. Arachidonic acid makes your muscles sore. The best time to use this would be after a month of training, once your muscles have adjusted and are no longer sore. Add in the arachidonic acid and you'll soon feel the burn from training again. Just make sure to stop the arachidonic acid at least two weeks before the big swim in order to bring down the inflammation in the muscles and ensure that you're fully recovered in time for the event. Also, as this is a pro-inflammatory, it may be important to use high doses of anti-inflammatory omega-3 fish oils once the training and the big event has finished to ensure that your body is healed from any possible damaging effects of inflammation. There's many things that you can do to help to optimise your training and to increase your chances of completing a successful marathon swim. There's no shortcuts when it comes to the total distance which you need to train each week for around three months. You also need to build up to this, which means starting training up to six months before the event, and this is a big commitment. Time off is important to get the most out of the training. Diet is incredibly important. Not only getting your protein and fat, but also having a low glycemic diet to keep you sensitive to insulin. There's nothing more tempting after a long, cold, tiring swim than eating or drinking a high carbohydrate food. As you're taxing your body a blend of mitochondrial boosting, endurance boosting herbs, some trace minerals, a good quality multivitamin, some natural anti-inflammatories like omega-3 fish oil, some strong antioxidants like liposomal vitamin C and astaxanthin will all have benefits, as well as some joint support formula. If you're trying to take in a lot of extra calories to bulk up, then digestive enzymes with every meal and a probiotic supplement would help to ease any stomach discomfort. Digestive enzymes can really help with unwanted gas from high protein diets also. You should practice your feeding schedule for the big swim at least once before the day as drinking 500 millilitres of water 
with 300 calories of carbs every hour is not easy. And don't forget to add alkalinizing pH drops. You can check out my other videos on thyroid support, chronic fatigue, on mitochondrial boosters, endurance boosters, SARMs, CBD, and if you're looking for motivation and drive, my videos on brain boosting herbs, choline sources and nootropics can help. Remember to always check with your doctor and any governing sports body before supplementing as rules can vary in different sports associations and countries. For more information about any herbs or supplements discussed in this presentation, check out my website.